time she sings that song, I, I just, what, what a wonderful song, amen. Hey, this morning, uh, Sunday, and I know that all last week I've been preparing and I begin to look over scripture and I'm thinking, man, how do I tie in Maple Street 2024 with a rededication, something in the Bible? Well, there's was three rededications in the Bible of the temple. Number one was whenever Ezra came back after Nebuchadnezzar had carried everybody over and just wiped out the entire uh, Jewish population, they came back in Ezra's time. And Ezra built it back, but not as good. And then it went on just a little bit further until uh, the time uh, that Nehemiah comes and he puts it back together. And then over in 6 BC, around 6 BC, Herod the Great, a pagan uh, tetriarch, he puts up the great temple that we all know of. So they all rededicated those, but none of those really fit for me. I begin to study scripture, and I begin to realize that there is one in scripture that more or less tells us where we are in 2024 and what God would want us to do as far as having a, a righteous rededication. Turn your Bible, turn your copy of God's Word, and turn to 2 Kings chapter number 23. 
And you're going to be introduced to a young king who started in his kingship. He was only eight years old. An eight-year-old king was put in charge of Israel, of God's great nation, Israel. And this eight-year-old king gives us the example of what a righteous rededication would be. Have you found your place? 2 Kings chapter number 23, verse number 1. We're going to start reading. The Bible says this, And the king sent and gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and to keep his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in the book. And all the people stood to the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, and the priest of the second order, and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal. I, I want to give you just a little bit of catch up with history. Josiah is the king. Josiah come into Israel and leadership at a time that Israel could not have been any lower. They had a moral problem. They had a governmental problem. They had a world problem. The world was just going upside down and there was no one left in the lineage to take over kingship other than this eight-year-old kid. This eight-year-old kid, his name is Josiah, and in, during Josiah's first ten years, Josiah was tutored and taught by the priest. He, they were tutored and taught by the scribes. And then finally, at, when Josiah was about 18 years old, they were cleaning out a section of the temple, and they come across a dusty old book. You see, the people that, uh, that had come to where they disregarded God's house, they didn't darken the doors of God's house. They put all the uh, ungodly things first in, in their city and in their uh, towns and in their communities. They had great examples of bad leadership. Amen? They had a, a, a king named Manasseh. Manasseh was Josiah's grand, uh, grandfather. Manasseh actually sacrificed his child on the altar in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount separate to uh, Asheroth, which uh, was a pagan god of the Grecians and the Romans and the Nebuchadnezzars, the Babylonians and others. He actually killed his kid. And the Bible says that Manasseh ran the streets of Jerusalem with blood because he was so wicked and vile. Manasseh passes away, and his son Ammon takes over. And Ammon was a spoiled, rich kid. He didn't want to govern. All he wanted to do was sit in the palace and have all the, uh, the amenities to the king. He only lived a couple of years till they assassinated him. And now here is this 18-year-old kid who's got to pull back Israel and the house of worship. And he comes in chapter 23, and he gives us some of the greatest instruction that we could have from Maple Street Baptist Church in 2024. What does he say? I want to talk to you about a righteous rededication, and I want to give you three simple things that if we can do this, God will honor and keep those doors open. If we don't do this, there's not enough things in the world that can keep this building from falling. How about it? Let's get into it. Number one, I want you to know that a righteous rededication is that you have got to see what Josiah saw, is that you've got to realize something that is not something you want to see, but it's there. And so many people miss this because, as I said earlier, they are so temporal, they are so uh, entertained, they are so uh, uh, anesthetized, if you will, by a culture that they see and equate something that is not really God. What are you talking about, Pastor? First of all, it's not the building. It was not the building. 
What got the, the Israelites in trouble and what got the Israelites in such turmoil is that they all the time would worship the building. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter number 7, verse number 6, Jeremiah cries out against Jerusalem and against Israel, and he says this. He says, you cry, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord shall save us, but there shall be no salvation because you have trust in stone and mortar, and you have missed that there is a God in heaven, and you worship the temple, but you don't worship the God of the temple. You get so enamored about where you go and sit down one Sunday is that you miss the one who is wanting you to stand up and see his glory. You're missing the magnitude and the grandeur of the God who Psalms chapter number uh, 19 says, the heavens and the earth declare the glory of his Lord. The heavens speak and they resound with the name of Jesus. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And we miss that. We're looking at a building. Does this building have screens, air conditioning? Do we have smoke mirrors? Do we have all the things that my kids might need to entertain themselves in the world? What kind of youth program you got, Pastor? What kind of college program you got, Pastor? What kind of things do you have? Man, I want to tell you what. I don't mind any of those things. But God called me to preach, not to play pickleball. It is that we miss the realization that it's not the building that should draw you to assembly. It is God that should draw you. And I'll be upfront and honest with you that the majority of the people in this community, in this country, and in this world are not looking for the God of heaven. They're looking for the things of the world. And so it's not the building. It is the person. It's the believer that God wants to use. You have to understand and realize this because Josiah says this. He says, I'm going to go to a building, but in that building, I am not looking for the walls to save me. I'm looking for the one to save me. And so we need to know that it is that this, this, he's not in the building. Paul said the exact same thing in the New Testament. Acts 17, 24 says this way. He said, God that made the world and all the things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, he dwelleth not in temples made with man's hands, as though he needeth anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath. And Paul, you know what Paul said? The same thing that Josiah said. Don't worship the building. And man, I want to tell you what, people worship the building. They worship, they go to assembly somewhere, they align themselves somewhere because of the entertainment and because of the ease and because of all the things of the earthly world satisfies them and they come in and out and they say to themselves, I'm good with God. And they don't change their lives. They just change their location. And that's one of the things that we have to guard against. If we are going to rededicate our lives, we have got to be able to understand and see that it is Jesus and Jesus only. You are the temple of God. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Paul said, you're it. God is not dwelling in the stone and the mortar. He's not dwelling in any part of the building. In fact, without you here, this would be nothing but a building. And when you leave, this is nothing but a building. And we slowly and surely say to ourselves, and we deify the building, and we miss what God wants us to believe, and that is that we are the temple of God. And so we have to have a realization of those things. It is not the place. It is the people. It is the person. It is you. And so therefore, if we are going to survive, we have to have a realization that God is not interested in the color of the carpet and how pretty the walls are. That God is not interested in how flamboyant all this can be. God is not interested in the show. 
God wants you to know that it is him and you. And so therefore, you have to realize that God is giving you a chance to rededicate yourself to someone, not something. That God is trying to get you to unite not with some building, but with the builder of the world. And so we need to understand this realization. Josiah said, it's not the building. I want to say to you, as beautiful as this place is, and ladies, you do a wonderful job. But as a pastor, I would, if this place burned down and we had to be underneath the shed out here, those that show up under the shed, you got it? You with me? Let's go to the second thing. There has to be a return. To what's right. A return to what's right. Look in verse number 2. 2 Kings chapter 23 verse 2. It says this. And the king went up into the house of the Lord. And all the men in Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And all the priests and the prophets and all the people both small and great. They went to. What is it that gives a semblance of understanding that you are dedicated or rededicated to the Lord. Is that you want to come to the fellowship of the church. You know, you, you say, Pastor, I can worship God uh, in, 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 on the lake. I can worship God in the mountains. I can worship... Man, let me tell you what, that's false theology. Because the Bible will never contradict itself. And the Bible is extremely clear. God's Word is extremely clear that you are commanded to be a part of the body of Christ. Remember, it's not the building, but it's the believers. And as the believers, you are commanded, you are called, you are commissioned to join ranks with other believers so that you can go into the world and tell them about Jesus. Yes, you can. You say, oh God, thank you for this beautiful day on the lake. But if you only tell God that, you've missed it because the Bible says that Christians are to reveal Jesus Christ in everything that they do. And I I hear it all the time. Well, I I can worship God just as good here or there. You are saying that the Bible is partially true. Because the Bible tells us very clearly what we can and what we should do, right? Amen? Does it not tell us that we are the body of Christ according to 1 Corinthians? You are the body of Christ. There are many members, but yet one body. And let me tell you something, child. You may be just a pinky finger, but if the pinky finger is not there, it's hard to hold anything. Amen? You may be just one eye, but if you ain't there, we go in circles. You may be, well, I ain't even going there, but if you ain't there, things back up. Do you see? Jesus is saying, if you want to be rededicated to me, if you want a righteousness about yourself, realize that you can't find me in a building. You have to know me personally. And then you've got to be one who returns back to what I told you and be a part of the body so that we, rightly fitted, can be a witness for Jesus Christ. When you're not here, you say, Pastor, nobody even knows I'm not here. I know you're not here. Man, I I love it how carnal Christians love to share with me some of the reasons that they're not going to be here. Pastor, I'm not going to be here next Sunday. I'm like, dude, don't even tell me. I don't want to hear. Yeah, we got we won free tickets down there at the good, a liquor store. We're going all to see the NASCAR Tally Daggy 500. I'll be back the next Sunday, Pastor. Oh, God. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Pastor, I'd be there Sunday, but it's tournament season. You know what? I mean? You're giving me a heart attack. Telling me stupid stuff like that, right? Uh, Yeah, Pastor, we'll be back in about a a month. Little Johnny, he's playing on the travel team. You want to rededicate yourself to the Lord? You've got to realize it's not about this building. It's about you. And that you have got to return to the body of Christ. You, You can't be a singular Christian. Amen? 
I, I want you to know that. You can't be a lone wolf. You can't be secluded. You can't be excluded. You are commanded to be a part of the body of Christ. And that means that when you're not here, there's a part of the body that's not functioning. And if that part of the body doesn't function, we become diseased and we become debilitated and eventually we die. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. But it's true. It is true. I mean... Think about it, guys. Come on. We, we have enough energy to get to the workhouse. We, we clock in. We clock out. We put our nose to the grindstone. We get beat with the whips of corporate America. And we are dedicated to be there, not late. And we'll stay late. And we do it. And we do it. And we do it. And like a mule chasing a carrot, we will continue that for 40 years. We won't miss a day at work. We get them kids to the schoolhouse, don't we? It's like herding cats. I remember when Corey and, and Channing and Jonathan were younger. Man, I don't know how Sheila did it. it you had to get up like the day before just to get those yard birds into the van, get them to the school and all this and all that, and it never ended. One of them always had something due. You know, oh, I forgot to tell you, Mom. It's a testimony to God's grace that they're still alive. She looks at her choked in many places. But we get them to the schoolhouse, don't we? I mean, we get to the clubhouse. I'm, I'm going to get you your business now. We get to the clubhouse. We, we go to our things, right? We, we go and we party hardy or we play in the ball fields and all these things. We wouldn't miss our game, right? Uh, we go to the warehouse. Some of you ladies, some of you men, but some of you ladies could spend all day long looking up this aisle and down that aisle and doing this and doing that. Where's my mother at? Amen. She put, she'll load her buggy up and she'll go back and forth and back and forth. She'll spend all day at the thrift store. Right before she checks out, she starts unloading her buggy. Oh, I really don't need this. I really don't need that. I really. And she just does this constant loop. Miss Shirley, where are you at? You do the exact same thing. We, we don't miss. No, Pastor, I'm not missing my thrift day. You know, the workhouse, the clubhouse, the warehouse. Well, we even make it to the outhouse, don't we? Don't we? You say, well, I don't have time for that. Yeah, well, you got time for that. It's not about any of those things. Why is it we're so easily distracted from the church? You think that there might be some carnality in your heart? You think that there might be some uh, deadness in your heart? You think that you might not be a part of the body? I can't miss church very many times without starting to feel anemic, starting to feel weak, starting to feel, you know, Tony said it the other day, he had to go out west with Titan, and he said, man, I hate... I I've missed church now for two Sundays. I can't miss another one. I can't stand it. I love to come to church. That's what I want to hear, is that wild horses can't keep you from church. And that's a, a carnal sign of a dedicated Christian, is that you are drawn to the body of Christ. You say, well, Pastor, why do People miss church so much. Why do people not get involved in the church? Well, Judges 24 tells us why. In those days, everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. Amen. Nobody sees it. You are spiritually blind. You got all these reasons, all these reasons, but there is no reason to push away Jesus Christ. He's died for you. He's provided for you. He's done all these things for you. But you have all these reasons. You want to rededicate this church? And you've got to realize that you're, you're the key. You are the key. And you've got to realize that you need to return back to what God wants you to be, which is a functional member of the body of Christ. Amen? It says this in Psalms 122. It says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm glad. I don't have to be here. I get to be here. 
There is people that are being laid in graves today that wish they had what you have. Can't come to God's house. There are sickness who want to be here. There are those who are in prison that want to be here. There are those who are away in battle-torn countries who would love to be here. And yet we drive by this church on our way to do other things. God help America. God help Cleveland, Tennessee. God help. What does it say? It says this in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. You know, the world's coming to an end, guys. I mean, we got nuts with their fingers on nuclear weapons. And tomorrow morning, you could wake up with a nuclear cloud over a desert in the Middle East, and your world would shut down today. You say, well, that's over there. Shows how much you know. I want to say to you today, you have a part to play in God's army. And as an army can't fight without soldiers because they're AWOL. You AWOL on God. I get a realization. You've got a good return. Last thing, and then I'll close this thing up. You've got to be revived. In 2 Kings chapter 23, Josiah revives himself. Let me say that again. Josiah revived himself. The Bible says in verse number 1, it says that Josiah went to the house of the Lord. It didn't say that he commanded everyone else. Josiah went. Josiah realized that he had to return to the Lord and that he, as a leader, he would return. He would hope that others would come. In verse number 3, it says this, And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to see to keep his commandments. Josiah entered into revival, and he did it three ways. Number one is that he sought God's presence. It says this, that the king stood by a pillar. You see the picture up there. If you look at the very top, you'll see that there is an entryway to the Temple Mount. And down at the very bottom, from the perspective of the picture, was King Josiah's palace. David made his palace below the temple because he always wanted to be reminded that God was above him. Josiah now walks up these stairs into the temple, and as he stops at these entrance of the pillars, he stops at one of these pillars, probably the center one, and he turns around and he says that he stood and he said, I want a revival, I want God's presence. He realized that God was going to meet with him. And then secondly, he sought God's pardon. Look in verse number three again. And he made a covenant before the Lord. He didn't make a deal with the Philistines or the Assyrians. He didn't make a deal with anybody. He made a covenant, a promise to the Lord. I believe that you cannot enter into revival unless you find God's presence and you ask for God's pardon. God help every one of us to be better. And then lastly, the revival is simply that you submit to God's plan. God's plan is this, to walk after the Lord. That's why it says in Proverbs chapter number 3, it says, seek ye the Lord. Amen? Seek ye out His path and His righteousness. That's why it says in Proverbs, uh, Psalms 23, it says, Thy way, thou leadest me beside the still water. God wants to be in charge. He wants to be in front. He doesn't want to hear you tell him where he wants you to be enter into revival. Second Chronicles 7.14 says this, If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You want this church to survive? You have to be in revival. You have to realize that you've got to return back to the cross of Jesus Christ. Get rid of all the garbage of saying that, well, I did this or I did that. Or, Man, you've got to get serious with God and enter into revival. Miss Connie, as you come, Tony, others. The right 
dedication is realizing that it's not the building, it's you. And when you realize that, you will have a desire to return back in humbleness and cry out unto God. God, forgive me where I've sinned. God, forgive me where I've laid down your cause. God, forgive me of all these things that I've done. I want to come back to you, and I want to have a revival. Start my heart again, Lord. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. I'm going to ask you, what kind of response do you have in your heart what kind of response are you going to give God? Josiah was one who realized that his country, his people, his, it was all going to die unless he did something. In the morning, there's families just like Josiah's that need you to step up and step out. Your city, your country needs you. To be a light in the darkness. So I want to ask you today. Will you be that? Will you be that? Everybody stand to your feet. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord today. We are His sanctuary. Praise His holy name this morning. If you want to come and join this church. Or if you want to come and be a better church member. I'll meet you at this altar right now. With thanksgiving.